Some people are saying that the fact there's a heat wave right now means that global warming is definitely a thing. Other people are saying that, on the contrary, global warming has actually been paused for quite some time now. Both of them can't be right, maybe neither of them is right. Well, let's have a look. It's been a tale of two heat waves here in the UK. On the one hand, you've had what many have labelled as hysterical takes, the OMG variety. Earth sends a warning with a map using a colour scheme to highlight the message of how hellishly hot it is. Boris Johnson accused of checking out as Britain swelters in searing heat. What Boris Johnson was supposed to be able to do about it, it's not entirely explained. But it's a crisis. He could at least have been in a crisis meeting to make the point, you would think. And these front pages, after the first day, were all very clear that it was going to get worse. Record heat due today. Airport forced to shut. Cops give nudie warning, which seems a bit off. I mean, I don't mind the police giving us a warning. They should definitely keep their clothes on while they're doing it. On the other hand, some people were keeping their clothes very much on. The Queen's Guard, for instance, who get to stand stoically still in the sun, wearing bloody great huge furry hats. Black hats. The better to absorb the heat. And the Prince of Wales didn't even take his jacket and tie off, which is the sort of British stiff upper lip that makes us proud to be British. Other papers simply took it as the time-honoured excuse to publish pictures of attractive young people wearing very little indeed and pulling their stomachs in while they pretend not to know that their photos are being taken. Exactly the sort of pictures of people enjoying themselves that we are now meant to disapprove of these days because only maps with hellish colours on them or pictures from places suffering with forest fires are now indicative of the moral panic we're supposed to have every time it's hot. Remember, for the avoidance of doubt, I absolutely support action on climate change. I think net zero is an appropriate policy target. And we will have plenty of challenges over the coming decades to improve our infrastructure and learn to adapt. Many of the consequences of that day of heat have shown that only too well. But let's discuss it in a grown-up way, as and when it's appropriate to do so. Does this heat wave definitely come directly from climate change? Well, the odds are definitely in favour. Anyone who claims certainty is probably overclaiming. What we do expect is that these sorts of events will happen more frequently in the future and that the peaks of intensity will be higher than they otherwise would have been. Some people have said that in the 1976 UK drought, it was just as bad and in some ways worse because it lasted two weeks, not two days even if it didn't hit the peak temperature that we just saw. Well, yes, if you just focus on the UK, just like some would have you just focus on the US, we're talking about global warming, though. Here's a map of what happened in 1976 alongside the map of what just happened. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I'm susceptible to arguments that suggest that those two don't look the same and that extremes might therefore be more likely in the second version. But I'm not yet ready to give up the old standard. The old standard has always been that individual events cannot with certainty be attributed specifically to climate change. Now, in the last couple of years, that has started to change with the work of Friedrich Otto on attribution, where she claims to have been able to make individual attributions much more quickly. I remain slightly cautious about that initiative, Firstly, because I know some other climate scientists in the mainstream, not the usual names from the full-on sceptics camp, are not wholly convinced, although there are certainly plenty that are. Secondly, I've seen Otto talking about one of the motivations for this work being potentially to empower future legal cases against, for example, fossil fuel companies to hold them directly liable for damages arising from specific incidents that can be pinned to climate change. That sounds very much like science being utilised in the name of campaigning. And it's based on a number of premises that I definitely don't support. So the blend of campaigning and science just intuitively makes me more sceptical. Not cynical, not dismissive, but sceptical of that science. And not at all a fan of that stated intention of how it would politically be used. So that's all very well. 
But you'll notice that my response to that has not been to suggest that the steady increases in global temperatures simply aren't happening. People who look up old newspapers from 100 years ago and say, look, it was hot on this day in the past. Well, they are misdirecting their audience. People like the Met Office say that the changes mean that once in a hundred years events will happen more often, like once in every 10 years or whatever it may be. So looking back a hundred years ago and saying, look, there was an extreme event. Well, yeah, thanks. We knew that. The point is that if you'll be saying that again in three years time when there's another one, and then again the year after, it's not the extremity of the event that's the point. People obsess about records being broken, for sure, which is pretty tiresome when it becomes the only focus, and that's certainly been the case this time. But global warming is about frequency as much as it is about new records being broken. But that all presupposes that it's happening at all, because a number of commentators are making a very definite and bold claim that global warming has been paused for a significant and growing period of time. Chief amongst these is a long-time climate sceptic, Christopher Monckton, Lord Monckton, with blog posts like this one. The new pause lengthens to seven years, ten months. And it's accompanied by a graph from the UAH satellite temperature set of lower troposphere temperatures, which looks a very persuasive-looking flat trend from 2015 to 2022. And some have certainly been persuaded. So Melanie Phillips, writing in the Times of London recently, wrote, Contrary to the dogma which holds that a rise in carbon dioxide inescapably heats up the atmosphere, global temperature has embarrassingly flatlined for more than seven years, even as CO2 levels have risen. And it's taken up as well by the Daily Skeptic website, which, as lockdown sceptics, used to publish some pretty interesting and challenging pieces on lockdowns and the issues around responses to the pandemic. But since rebranding has rather dragged itself down with what I hold to be some pretty appalling environmental content, sadly. And here too, the claim is repeated. The latest pause, what alarmists call global heating, now stretches to 92 months. The idea that you can measure climate trends in months is something of an odd one, particularly because, unlike Monckton, he accompanies his piece with the non-cherry-picked version of the UAH chart. Rather than going from 2015, it shows the full data set from when the satellite started operation in 1979. Now, most of us will look at that graph and we see plenty of natural variation in the context of a steady increase. But he claims it clearly shows that global warming started to run out of steam about 20 years ago. No, it's not what I'm getting from that graph. And then he goes on to make a completely different argument in the next paragraph, saying that, yes, the graph shows upward movement, but one is inclined to remark, so what? All of this is margin of error stuff, footling increases picked up only by highly sensitive measuring equipment. This is now like a Russian military propaganda unit throwing multiple mutually exclusive arguments into the frame at the same time, ignoring the fact that they contradict each other. The it's only a small amount argument is a fallacy that we've dealt with here often. What can sound like only a little can nevertheless result in major changes. After all, the difference in average global temperatures between today and the last glaciation is just 5 degrees C. So yeah, what you dismiss as footling amounts has real world consequences. But let's go back to the graphs, because of course what he has done is rather to expose the trick that Lord Monckton has been employing, that of cherry picking. This is Monckton's graph, and if you look at the full picture, what you see is lots of routine variability, but a consistent upwards trend. To take one of the biggest spikes, 2016, and start your series from just the year before that, guarantees that you can produce something with a flat line until the next big spike comes along, which it will in due course. This is why we say that climate trends have to be seen long term. With a sort of natural variability you see in the data records to think that you can have a monthly update. The pause has lengthened to so many months. It is just an exercise in sleight of hand. 
as Zeke Housefather points out on the Carbon Brief website, if you were going to play that game, how come Lord Monkson wasn't posting in 2018 about the astonishing acceleration of global warming from 2011 to 2018? And if the world scientists are such, quote, alarmists, how come they weren't all talking about that at the time? If they were genuinely motivated to massage the figures to tell the worst story, that would be a gift they seem to have curiously neglected to use. The answer, of course, is that because both are examples of cherry-picking. From 2011 to 2013, temperatures were a little cooler than the expected average, and then 2016 was pushed a lot higher due to a super El Nino event. So anyone interested in what the data really tells us would know that transition shouldn't be taken at face value. But that's exactly the process that Lord Monkton and others take part in when they take that El Nino high point as their bid to produce a flat line for their narrative today. Here's that graph again, with the underlying trend shown in the black dashed line, Monkton's trend by the blue line, and the fake high trend by the red line. Not only is that blue line cherry picked, but you can see that it even exists above the expected average. Moncton's flatline temperatures are all above what would be expected at this point. Neither the acceleration nor the pause are real. Look, this is very basic stuff. Why do people fall for it, you might ask? Because they accept the framing made by the people they trust. For people on their side, as they see it. To be fair, for people on the other side, and I mean the extremist campaigners, do just as good a job of cherry picking in their own way. But right now, we're talking about this version. And they'll say things like, since the alarmists say that it's all driven by CO2, how come CO2 went up this year, but the temperatures were lower this year than last year? Now, the misdirection is the idea, first of all, that climate scientists say that the only thing influencing year-to-year weather variability is CO2. Nobody says that. It is well understood and described, and we've talked about here often, for instance, how El Nino and La Nino events impact individual years, as well as volcanic eruptions, for instance. Zeke Housefather showed a graph that had the El Nino and La Nina effects removed from a number of different data series, and it shows a much more even increase in global surface temperatures. You should also bear in mind that the satellite measurements used in those previous graphs only measure warming in one place, the lower troposphere. The troposphere is the large, lower layer of the atmosphere. A lot of the Earth is covered by water, the majority of the excess heat being retained because of global warming, over 93% of it goes into the oceans. Ocean temperatures are much less variable on a year-to-year basis than those surface temperatures. So this graph, using data from Cheng et al. 2022, shows the global ocean heat content in zettajoules, which is a billion trillion joules. It shows a change since the baseline of 1940 to 1949. The light blue area is water in the upper oceans, down to a depth of 700 metres. The darker blue is the deeper oceans. Not much sign of a pause, I would suggest. And this is rather the point. The most desperate of those sceptics, the ones who say it's not happening, rather than those who say, yes, it is happening, but the impact won't be so bad, or whatever it is exactly they're saying, they are the ones that are left now with very little that can even be cherry-picked to support that view. The UAH satellite stream of the lower troposphere is one of the few where what comes out can be used even to suggest it's slower than others say. Therefore, you'll see people in the comments section and elsewhere declaring that only that measure is the one that matters. Well, you know. If you want to know what's happening in the world, of course, you look at all the measures, all the different ones. The ocean heat content is a huge one, as we've seen, but there are plenty of other indicators showing what's happening in the real world. Sea ice, which has been declining. Some skeptics point to the fact that polar bears are still thriving in areas where sea ice has substantially retreated, which is great if you're arguing about polar bears. It rather undercuts those who say that sea ice is as plentiful as it's ever been. And multiple other indicators. Glaciers across the world are melting. If sceptics can find one or two that aren't, expect that those are the ones you get to hear about. But mostly, no, that, overwhelmingly, that is not the story. In many places, spring is starting earlier. 
A number of species of animals and birds are migrating further towards the poles. I doubt they did so because they saw a graph that climate alarmists had massaged to make the past a little bit colder. Tree lines are shifting poleward and upward. Trees also don't read about climate change and make their decisions accordingly. Sea surface temperatures going up, land temperatures as measured by thermometers going up, and so on and so on. And you still have to say this because, yes, the fact that it's really been hot in the UK could mean that it's just a slightly hotter than normal summer, just like we sometimes have anyway. But the fact of all the multiple other indicators and the fact that it's been hotter or drier than normal in quite a few more places than just the UK, these are indicators that you should trust a little more then you should trust those who abuse your trust by showing you graphs like this and telling you that they mean something. And on that subject, a few years ago, climate science blogger Tamino showed just how much Tony Heller needed to torture the data to get one of his custom-made graphs showing that there hasn't been any warming, indeed there's been cooling. Start with the US average temperatures. Well, that's no good. There's a clear trend. What about US low temperatures? How cold it gets at night, in other words? Yeah, still no good. Clear trend. US high temperatures? Still an obvious trend, but it's a little better. Maybe if we poked around a bit. Split them into seasons. See what we get. Well, winter's out for sure. Yeah, spring out, autumn out. Summer looks a bit more promising. It's still been increasing overall. But because of that nice big aberrant hump in the 1930s from the Dust Bowl era, maybe we could do something with that. How about starting the data set in 1920 rather than when it actually starts in 1895? Well, bingo. Finally a graph that looks like there's nothing to see here. All I had to do was pick one of 12 possible combinations. All of the others point in the opposite direction. But it still looks like it's getting warm now, approaching the level of the heat bowl, which wouldn't exactly be a good thing. So let's do a homemade graph. And then rather than gridding to get representative spatial breakdown of all the different stations, I'll just do a simple average. Noah and the like say that this isn't right, but that's OK because I've persuaded my audience that they're all fraudsters anyway, so they're not going to listen to anything they have to say. Boom! See? See? It is getting colder in the US, and that means the whole world because... Uh, reasons. You have to admire such artistry. So long as you don't think that Hella knows better than the birds and the animals and the trees what's actually happening in the real world. Now look, I wasn't intent on talking about Hella when I started this video, but since the topic of people using graphs to pretend in an alternative reality applies, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that's where it ended. The question I suppose is this, how many years do there have to be of once in a hundred year events before the people who cling to those narratives finally concede the simple, very, very, very basic reality that the planet is warming. Bear in mind, accepting that reality doesn't require you to believe that AOC or Joe Biden's preferred solutions are remotely sensible. It doesn't require you to accept the word of anyone who says the planet is doomed and young people will die young because of climate change or any of that. I mean, none of that is supported by the data. Just requires you to come up with the response that makes sense in the face of physical reality. Policies that ignore reality, unlikely to be good policies, I would suggest. Many of the people who accept that basic reality propose there should be a target of net zero CO2 in order to halt that process of warming. But would it? Would it work? I mean, once you've accepted the reality that it's warming, you then have to ask if it can actually be stopped by what people are proposing to do about it. That is a big question, and I did a deep dive on that in this video, which if you've gotten this far, you should definitely watch next.